Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. I'm Kevin Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. You might know me for my other Beatles program, which is a weekly syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing. I'm being joined by my two other regulars. First of all, contributing writer for Billboard magazine, Access.com, that's AXS.com, Variety, Goldmine, a whole bunch of publications. He's the man who's always at the forefront of Beatle News. And that's our own Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. Wasn't that a good introduction? That was beautiful. That was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. The forefront. The forefront. Forefront. Okay. <laughs> and also, we have the author of the book, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. And also for the ebook, Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. Also a contributing writer for Beatle Fan. Many years at the New York Times in their classical department and writing for a lot of different journals, especially the Wall Street Journal. Mm-hmm. And that is our own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, as we note Paul McCartney's 75th birthday this week, we're going to be doing a tribute to Paul and just talking about Paul and looking back at his career and his many talents. But before we do that, we have a little bit of Beatle news to get underway. First of all, um, I'm sure that you must have heard that John Lennon's iconic song, Imagine, was named Song of the Century by the National Music Publishers Association. And this was at an award ceremony last week for which uh, Yoko and Sean attended. And um, also to go along with that is the news that Yoko has been given a songwriting credit for the song Imagine, all because of an interview that John Lennon gave shortly before he died to the BBC, where he basically said that Yoko was a big influence on the song because of her book Grapefruit. The passages in there in her poetry, it all started with Imagine This and Imagine That. So um, John had said in the interview that at the time he felt that He didn't want to give Yoko a credit because he was being more selfish, and I think his words were a bit more macho, (laughs) but he didn't give Yoko a songwriting credit, but what they did at this ceremony was to correct that. So it is now being considered a Lennon Ono composition. So I know that Sean said online that it was uh, the proudest day of his life, very happy for his mom and, of course, his father. So your thoughts on that, guys, about Imagine? How about you, Steve? Well, I'm really, I'm, I'm real pleased. I mean, it makes, it makes a lot of sense, and I know there was some social media criticism of it, but it, it really does make sense because uh, of that in the BBC interview. You mentioned the social media comment by uh, Sean. He, uh, uh, through Yoko's uh, ma- uh, manager, I got a text from him that said, uh, that said basically the same thing for my story for Billboard, it said, when they officially acknowledged through my father's account that my mother co-wrote Imagine the Song of the Century, it may have been the happiest day of mine and my mother's life. By the way, the award formally is called the National Music Publishers Association Centennial Song Award. It's, I mean, same thing, but just, mm-hmm. to, just to say that. But I'm, I'm real pleased. I mean, uh, you know, you, you have to wonder why he didn't, you know, I mean, he said why he didn't do it, but you know, it's correcting a long overdue mistake, and I'm glad for her. I'm glad it happened while she was still around. And according to Sean, it brought tears to Yoko's eyes, and mm-hmm. I think that's really cool. I think that's great. Right. Yeah, Alan. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I I, I thought it was actually pretty clear that Imagine was influenced by uh, the grapefruit stuff and the uh, the. The, this group of pieces that she had where she suggests what you should do. Um, I, uh, there was a formal name for them. I, it slips my mind. But, um, but uh, you know, maybe I think that because I heard the interview when John gave it and I, you know, must have said, oh, yeah, right, you know. But, you know, obviously John should get credit um, for co-writing Midsummer New York, but... <laughs> 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 hmm. Okay. But, uh, 
Yeah, you know, I mean, look, the two of them um, didn't share credits the way, say, Paul and Linda did it, it, you know, early in the the Wings days. I mean, a lot of those songs on on Ram and other early albums Mm -hmm. are, are listed to you know, as both of them, and uh, and Paul actually made a point of of that being the case because his publisher sort of um, you know challenged it. But you know, but in this case, yeah, I mean, it's 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 obvious that John was influenced by what she was doing, and he said in that interview as well that apart from coming up with the concept, she came up with some of the lyrics. You can't be more plain than that in terms of whether she mm-hmm. deserves a writer credit, right? So mm-hmm. I think it's I think it's really nice. I think it uh, it you know speaks to what their creative relationship was, and um, I'm glad they did it. Yeah, you know when it comes to these songs, who are we to debate this when the artist spells out? Yeah, you know, exactly. In, in this interview, mm-hmm. exactly that that Yoko was an influence on the song. You know, are you going to go against the artist who created the song in the first place? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, if you, know, you are, if you are, it, it means that there's really something else going on in your psyche that perhaps you should attend to that has nothing to do <laughs> mm-hmm. with, you know, with the song, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is something we could debate, in a, you know, but I, I think this actually helps her public you know her artistic image i mean everybody kind of thinks yoko is way out there and and in many respects she is but also you know there was she had a you know there is a part of her artistic you know influence that or in her artistic um her art that is grounded and that's and that kind of adds to that so Mm -hmm. i think that's that's a good thing right well, at some point in the future, we'll do we'll do a discussion about songwriting and songwriting credits in the Beatles' lives, group and solo, and that'll be an interesting conversation. And we'll bring up Imagine in that topic, mm-hmm. in that okay. in that conversation. Okay. okay? Yep. Another okay. piece of news concerns Danny Harrison, because he has signed a deal with BMG Records, and he'll be releasing his first solo album this fall. Hmm. We don't know what it's going to be called, but this is not. An album from the new number two is listed as a Danny Harrison album. And he is going to be doing a few dates coming up in uh, July, playing at the Echo Club in Los Angeles, July 24th, and playing at the Panorama Music Festival. That's in New York City, so I can try and catch that. That's on July the 30th. So, um, you know, Danny, after following a lot of years with the new number two and doing a lot of film scores, he's been involved with that, as has Sean, we should say. The two of them really, in recent years, doing a lot of work for scoring films. But uh, he's now embarking on a solo album, and uh, we'll see if he has a band with him, if it's just him alone. We don't know yet. Have Mm -hmm. you heard anything about this, uh, Steve? No, I have not. Mm -hmm. I I have not. I did see the news of the... The solo gig, but uh, the but no, I haven't heard about the rest. So, right. Well, it'll be interesting to hear what his new album sounds like, and if it's similar to anything that he's done recently, especially with the new number two. Mm-hmm. Any any thoughts on this, Alan? Uh, no, you know, I, I've I've liked the various projects he's done over the years, including the new number two. He's done some other collaborations with people too, and. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking forward to it because he's, uh, you know, he's a good musician. He's an inventive musician, and uh, I, I, I think it's very promising news. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other news you want to get to, Steve? Well, there was a a picture talking about social media. There was a picture that um, Ringo posted up on social media this past week of him holding a CD. And everybody, uh, a lot of people assumed that that was Ringo's new CD. And I have talked to his publicist, and I can tell you it is not his his new CD. Uh, They do not have a title. They did not have a title as of a couple of days ago. Mm. And I'm sure we'll get an announcement when when it happens. But any you know any a lot of people were assuming that that was his CD, and it, it is not. Now it brings up the question of you know when is he when is he going to announce will he announce soon you know and I assume that that's probably going to happen but uh, that wasn't it so mm-hmm. it's just another case of people making stuff up 
<laughs> through social media, which you can do so easily, and spreading false information. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Or to be fair, it's really a case of people adding two and two and getting 18. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. And one one more thing, let me be because I didn't want to forget this at the end. Um, for those of you that are into ebooks, John Lennon in his own right is out as an ebook for a dollar ninety nine at Amazon. Uh and it has the drawings. I could I have stumbled on it the other day and I was absolutely floored. I couldn't believe it. And I bought it and it's and it, it looks really I mean it it's it is what it is. It's it's got the drawings. Mm-hmm. So yeah, well, you should keep us up to date on the ebook situation because I'm I sure def- I definitely will. You know, a lot of books, past and present, probably are available as ebooks, and fans don't even know about it. So, right. Well, well, Alan told told us a, a couple months ago about uh, uh, Love Me Do, um, which I didn't know about, and uh, and uh, that was a great one to pick up. Uh, mm. I th- the price on that, by the way, Alan has gone up now. Mm. I think it was five ninety nine when you mentioned it. And it's now eight. I saw it today. It was eight ninety nine. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. still, that's cheaper than you'd pay for it in print. A lot cheaper because it's you know, that's one of uh, you know the uh, seminal Beatle books. Um, mm. So. Yeah. Well, the price went up only because Alan publicized it. So probably yeah. That's the book by Michael Braun. I think it might have been it might have been Al actually. <laughs> yeah, okay. but hey, you know, I, I I like ebooks. I mean, I, I from my I from my days of riding the subway a lot when I lived in New York, I, I constantly was reading books on my phone. I read huge amounts, but now I, I think of them as you know these things are are so small and portable, and you know small in terms of file size. I mean, you can walk around at this point with a really really decent Beatles library on your phone and always have it at your fingertips. Or your iPad, right. you know, right? Um, I mm. mean, you can get Lewison's books on it, uh, or the, at least tune in. Um, I'm not sure that the others are available on PDFs, but I, I think they're pirated, um, right? But you know, with tune in and with a, with a legitimate ebook, you can do a search and a text search and things like that, and it's uh, you know, it's very handy to have. I I love using them now. Mm-hmm. I do too. I like paper books it's- too, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I have a I have a Kindle too, and and uh, I'm constantly buying stuff for it. It's become an obsession. But <laughs> in, in any event, okay. Well, let's move on to our main topic, which happens to be Mr. McCartney. Uh, on June the 18th, he celebrated his 75th birthday. So we're going to be talking about you know all the reasons why we admire him <laughs> and uh, his many talents that we've observed through his entire career, and we're each going to pick apart. Uh, a certain aspect of Paul's talents and his career, and so why don't we start with Alan? Okay, what um, what I was thinking about in, in in terms of you know Paul's career and Paul's musicianship is well his musicianship, um, mm. really specifically in terms of his instrumental work, because. Really, I mean, I, I, it's something that I think we often take for granted, you know, is part of the sound, he's part of the Beatles, part of, his, you know, then Wings and his solo stuff. And, and he puts out tracks and we take them in as a full experience. But if you really start focusing on what he's doing instrumentally, particularly, yeah, there's some amazing stuff going on. And, you know, so I could break it down into sort of categories like, you know, Paul as a bass player. I mean, I Mm -hmm. think... I think he's recognized as one of the great rock bass players. You know, I don't think anybody would contest that. But, you know, people often point to the bass playing on Sgt. Pepper, which really is incredible. I mean, it's Mm -hmm. absolutely composed, contrapuntal bass playing that adds a whole lot to those songs and is is a, a really an important part of what you focus on when you listen to them, even if you know, even if it's subliminal, but usually it's not. Usually it's right out there. And uh, but for me, I mean, it goes all the way back pretty much to the beginning. I mean, if you listen to All My Lovin', there's that walking bass line that's, that starts as a descending pattern and then bounces around a bit. And, you know, I, I find it a, a, an absolutely beautiful melodic bass line. And there's so much else going on in the song, like 
the vocal melody and the the uh, the rhythm guitar, that sort of jangly rhythm guitar thing that you can almost overlook it. But what Paul's doing there is really incredible, you know? There are a couple of things that are, let's say, sly lifts, like, you know, Chuck Berry's I'm Talking About You bass line, you know, sort of morphed on, grafted on to I Saw Her Standing There. And, you know, and some other things, too. I mean, you know, you, you, you get him referring to the bassists he admires sometimes. There's another one, uh, well, and and people actually pick up on on him too. I mean, Drive My Car, particularly the bass line, started out, I believe, as an Otis Redding riff, okay? Right. And then it got picked up by Jimi Hendrix in Crosstown Traffic, and it became kind of, it got moved to the guitar line in Crosstown Traffic, but it's still there, and, and the big clue there is that they're both songs about cars one way or another, you know? But it's it's uh, it's the same riff, and... Um, hmm. So, okay, then, you know, as a guitarist, I think, again, you know, people sometimes overlook because, you know, I think when when something like Revolver came out, I'm not sure we even knew that it was Paul playing lead on Taxman. But, you know, once we found out that and and some of the other guitar lines, I mean, he'd been been playing lead guitar on several songs until then, you know, some on, um, was it Another Girl or You're Gonna Lose That Girl? Yeah. Uh, another girl. Okay. Um, you know, and that's okay, sort of, you know, bluesy playing. It's, it's, it's nice. But on Taxman, it's absolutely sizzling. And mm-hmm. you kind of think, wow, you know, I mean, what must have that have been like for George to give up the lead solo on his own song mm-hmm. and have, you know, such an incredible solo sort of, you know, bursting out of the speakers when people will assume it's him, but it's Paul, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and then from there on, I mean, I think I think at that point he made some sort of a leap as a guitarist, or at least as a guitarist whose work we were hearing, you know? And then, you know, on, on there's several songs on Pepper he plays lead on, not least the title song. And mm-hmm. uh, But now... Good morning, good morning. Good morning, yeah, good morning. That's right. Yeah. But, you know, and now he is playing a lot of, you know, or post Beatles, he played a lot of guitar on stage. I mean, you know, at first it was, you know, acoustic guitar yesterday, that kind of thing. And, and, and I think some other things in, in the Wings period, too. He, he didn't pick up the guitar quite as much as he does now, I think. But, um,. I wish he'd do a lot more lead guitar work on stage because one of my favorite moments is at the end of, of his concerts when they're doing the end and they're all trading lead guitar solos. And, you know, you don't see enough of him playing lead yeah. on stage. You know? Yeah, but you see more than you used to, you know. And hmm. I think he's, uh, you know, he really is an incredible guitarist. Um, I This is a guy who... and and. I should say drummer too, because as we know, you know he overdubbed you know some drums in the Beatles things. Um, he had plenty of suggestions for Ringo about things that he wanted, but he's also you know there are a couple of his albums where he plays all the instruments, including drums, and you know he's he's a very good drummer. I mean he he can play all the instruments of a rock band, and you know and better than a whole lot of people who actually play those instruments as their job. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, he just strikes me as being so intensely musical that I, I just get the feeling that if you hand Paul any instrument, he'll, within a few minutes, be able to get something out of it. I mean, he's just mm-hmm. that, that kind of player, you know? There, is, there are some people like that, and, and he's one of them. And that's, uh, you know, I think we, we may not think of him as an instrumentalist quite as as much as maybe we should because it's part of the package and we think of him as a vocalist and a songwriter and and all the other things he does but simply as an inventive player you know mm. he's just incredible so that's that's what I was was th- have been thinking about when uh you know we were talking about 
um, his birthday, you know. I mean, it, it, and the other thing about, uh, you know, he's he's battered his voice around a little bit over the years, and, and that's understandable. And also you get to a certain age and it just begins to change. But his instrumental chops, there's no aging there at all mm, from what point. I can see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I got a couple of questions based on what you just said. Hmm. Um, and actually, one of the things that I love Paul does as a songwriter, which he doesn't do that often these days, is when he writes counter melodies mm-hmm. in his songs. Mm. And great examples of that would be like silly love songs. You've got three melodies going on at the same time mm-hmm. in the song. Wanderlust, there's two melodies going on at the same time. I sometimes wonder, because you just put this thought in my head, Alan, because of the fact that as a bass player, he writes melodies that are not the same as the melody of the song. Right. That probably it gives him this skill to think of something else that fits along with the main melody. And like I can't even imagine a song like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds without that bass line. Right. You know, it's got a very floating bass line, which doesn't sound like the melody. It's different from the main melody mm-hmm. of Lucy in the Sky. So I think maybe his skill of writing counter melodies, and he's done this a lot, though not in recent years, but, you know, I think maybe the fact that he's a bass player probably helped him mm-hmm. to, to achieve that skill. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if there's if this if this has any bearing on it at all. But you know, when you study counterpoint and you study, you know, Bach, who was really the master of counterpoint, the first thing, I mean, you look in a lot of Bach music, and basically all there is is the bass line with a bunch of numbers underneath it, which indicate what the harmonies are above it, and you would fill them in based on what those numbers are. But you have some voicing choices, but the bass was always crucial. In, mm. in that kind of counterpoint. And, you know, it's probably completely coincidence, but maybe not, you know, maybe the fact that he is such an inventive bassist and the bass was really for, for a lot of rock music, sort of accompanimental and, um, and, you know, easy, you know, basically people, a lot of people just outline the chord or just play and play the roots, you know, and, and, uh, but he was never someone who did just that, you know, he's, it's, it's always been more. And, uh, yeah, he, he really does have a, a great contrapuntal imagination. Yeah. Do you know if when he did the baseline, the walking baseline that you are referring to and all my love, and was that something new for rock or was that something that had been done before? Um, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, maybe some of the Motown guys did stuff like that. Um, in a lot of the sort of top 40 pop kind of rock, there wasn't a lot of that going on. There wasn't a lot of inventive bass playing. You know, it, it, it's very possible. I mean, where where it was happening was in Motown, and, and we know that he listened to that. But um, So it, it's hard to say whether he was absolutely the first, but... F- for his peer group, he was doing something that nobody else was really doing. Mm. Yeah. What did you think of his drumming? Because there are, you know, a lot of examples in his solo career, in particular. I mean, I love the drumming on songs like "Helen Wheels." Yeah. You know, it's just, it's just it's yeah. simple, it's basic, but it's got a groove that fits. You know. Yeah, I, I, I think he's I think he's quite a good drummer. I actually saw him drum once. Um, I, I think I might have told this story, but there was a in 1989 there was a, a round table, a press round table at the Lyceum in New York. Um, and while we were all sitting there waiting for the round table to begin, Paul came out and sat at the drum set and played kind of a, a reggae kind of groove. Then Linda came out and played guitar. Um, I can't remember what everybody else was playing, but basically everybody picked up an instrument that was not their normal instrument to play in the band, that 1989 mm. band. And they jammed for a while, and I, I thought that was really fascinating. But, but you know, the drumming there was, was pretty good. And, um, you know, and I, I've also talked to Denny Sywell about Paul's drumming, and, uh, and, and we may have on this show, too, um, when, we when, did. He, when he was on. and. And he mm. thought he was really a, a, a quite good drummer. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, one of my favorite moments in watching Paul in concert, because we never see him drum, is when he was in MTV's Unplugged. 
And he actually did drum mm-hmm. for Ain't No Sunshine, if you remember. Right. Because Hamish Stewart sang lead on that. It was just, it's a rare moment when you mm-hmm. actually watch Paul drumming mm-hmm. <laughs> on stage. Yeah. I wish he'd do more of that, too. Yeah. Anyway, what about his piano playing? Oh, yeah, Alan? I forgot. I forgot about <laughs> his piano playing. Um <laughs> But, you know, yeah, he's, again, you know, early in the Beatles years, it was pretty rudimentary, but he mm. very quickly came up with a very fluid piano style. And you, you think of things like, what was that? Is that Little Woman Love? You know, there's a sort of yep. ro- rollicking kind of, you know, by the time he's at that point, you know, he is very, very fluent on the, on the keyboard. And you also hear it in some of the outtakes of Pepper. Uh, and particularly in, for instance, the the piano parts in A Day in the Life that mm-hmm. he plays, you know, those are those are really, you know, it's not like the, it's like a list piano concerto, but for that song, what he's doing is absolutely perfect. And uh, but you also hear him messing around on the piano on some of the other outtakes, and you can hear that he's got this kind of, you know, barrel house sort of quasi jazz thing going on that hmm. uh you know again like i say if you hand him an instrument i bet he can make something of it and if he gets interested in it like the keyboard and he's going to devote some time to it he'll master it you know I, I i bet he could give a lot of rock pianists um and there were some great rock pianists uh, mm-hmm. a run for their money you know hmm. mm-hmm. i do kind of yeah. wish you know i mean i, I do kind of wish that he had learned to read notation, you know, he has always said, well, you know, I didn't want to do that because I was afraid of being influenced and, you know, and, and the example he gives is that, uh, he found out that, uh, somewhere Leonard Bernstein somewhere from West Side Story is actually the slow movement of, I think, the Beethoven Second Piano Concerto. And he, mm. said, and, and he mm. says, you know, I, I, I don't want to, like, have that kind of accident. But, you know, in Bernstein's case, it obviously wasn't an accident. It was deliberate, you know, it was an homage. Mm. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the one thing McCartney would have gained, and I don't know that... I don't know that it would have been a huge gain um, because he's done quite well without knowing how to read. But Mm. it just would have been possible for him to just, you know, flip through a book of music, sit down and play it. And, you know, know, he always used to like to play that Bach Boré that he eventually turned into the intro to Blackbird. He said that he Mm -hmm. and George used to play it because it was on a Chet Atkins record. But he always plays it kind of wrong. And it's not that difficult to play. All he would need is to have the music put in front of him if he could read it and just say, oh, yeah, like that. Easy. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I, I think it's, you know, something that it's it's a pity that he didn't do. It's not, you know, earth shattering pity. It's just that I think um, I I think he would have benefited from it. Yeah. It, it, um, it's interesting on how you look at that because the Beatles achieve what they did without being formally trained yeah. and just uh, whatever came to them naturally, if they felt it was right on the record, then they went with it. And yeah. if they ta- were taught how to do everything properly, like this is music theory and you can use these chords with these chords, whatever, it probably would have – you probably wouldn't have had the same result. <laughs> on certain songs well, where uh, an, an odd chord would have worked better, you know? That's if they decided to follow the rules, but all great yeah. composers become great composers by jettisoning the rules. Mm. They just did it intuitively, you know? Right. True. Okay. Um, Steve, how about you? What area did you want to talk about? Well, I went through uh, his his diversity of uh, mostly things outside of music, although I, I did go through music, but I think you're going to go through that, mm. so I won't I won't touch on that t- too much. But one one thing I I was sitting here thinking that none of us would probably mention that I will just mention briefly, also is his personality, and I think that's been I, I that is probably um, you know a, a, a huge factor in the whole. Beatles history. I mean, his he was the. I mean, we, we all know that you know how 
on the Ed Sullivan show that he was the one the girls were screaming at the most. You know, he was the one that that had the biggest legion of female followers. There was a lot of, you know, female followers that still like him a lot. But his, it also, just his personality, he's had a very, you know, um, you know, uh, he's been very, very personable, whereas, you know, uh, there are some rock stars that are not. And he's has the reports are that uh, and Alan, you can tell us since you've met you. You've now I have not met him, although I have been in close range to him that wow. he, he seems like, a, you know, he seems like a very nice guy, mm-hmm. which doesn't always happen in rock and roll. Right, and he's apparently stayed that way pretty much. So, I um, mean, do you want to comment on that, Alan? Yeah, you know what he is incredibly good at is first of all, he knows he just knows that someone coming in to interview him for the first time or meet him is really going to be nervous because he knows who he is and he knows they know who he is, and it's you know you're just going to be nervous. He puts you immediately at ease. He mm-hmm. he he is funny and loose and friendly, and he also has this incredible talent among that that you don't see that much among interviewees. But some some are really good at it. He is absolutely the best at this, which is making you feel, even though you know intellectually that this is absolutely not the case. <laughs> he, he makes you feel that what you have to ask him and what you may have to say in comments in between and that the discussion you're having at the moment is the most important thing to him at the time. Now, you know <laughs> that it's not. You just know it's not. But, <laughs> but he is so good at putting you at ease that that's what you feel. You feel like, wow, you know, I was sort of scared about this, but it's like we're pals, you know, but, you know, you're, you're not mm-hmm. pals. But, but um, it's, you know, he's, he's, he, he really is exceptionally good at that. And, and that's a skill that, you know, mm-hmm. when you talk about it being, you know, his personality and, you know, him being the one the girls were after and all that. And, you know, John used to characterize it as like he's the PR guy. Well, maybe yes, maybe no, but it's a skill that not everybody has. And, um, you know, among among performers, I mean, some performers are, you know, is that right? You know, nasty. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and if, if someone could be full of himself, it could be, you know, he would have reason. And he doesn't yeah. behave that way. And, and that's... Uh, you know, I'm sure there are people who've seen a different side of him. Um, but you know, if you if you anger him in some way, you know, you're going to know it. But mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, as as someone to have a chat with on friendly terms, it's just really an incredible experience. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some people call that the PR side of him. Other people call it the professional side of him. Yeah. And um, he always makes you feel good. <laughs> About yeah. yourself after an interview's done, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, even, even feeling, yeah. Even even a non-interview. I mean, uh, I mean, we've all kind of had. I, I think we've all kind of had encounters with him. You, Alan, you've talked to him. I mean, I know at the you know at the Walk of Fame when I was standing practically right next to him. I mean, he was just he was really you know he was really cool. I mean, there were people all over, people screaming at him, you know, fans fans yelling things at him and he was you know he was playing it very cool he was very nice in fact it was that day that somebody had brought a replica of uh, the hoffner bass guitar and he he saw it and he motioned for it and he signed it right in front mm. of the fan right in, in fact he was standing in front of me when he signed it but i mean that was a, that was very cool you know that was mm-hmm. a very nice thing to do so but anyway that wasn't the i mean i that was something that i didn't think we would mention that we probably should but i just wanted to mention some of his diverse you know outside of music i mean the 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 list and i couldn't believe in going through my and doing the research you know trying to look up stuff for the show all the stuff he's he, that he has happened to him mm-hmm. he's done he's been an artist i mean you can and before i preface this you can judge 
up and down whether all this stuff is good or not. That's not what we're going to do. Is we're just mentioning. I mean, he, he has tried. He has done so many different things. He's been an, he's been an artist. You mean like a painter? When you like a him. painter, a painter. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, he's done. He has a long history of avant-garde music, which I assume you're going to get into, right? Are you going to get into well, that? Somewhat. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, the one thing that I think for Beatle fans that they think about a lot is Carnival, Carnival of Light, which we talked about with uh, Bruce Spicer a couple weeks ago, who has heard it, by the way. And if you haven't heard, if you didn't hear that show, you should go back and listen to it because he does talk about what what the song sounds like. He actually did a collaboration with Yoko. He he was on stage with Allen Ginsberg. He was uh, co-founder of LIPA, Liverpool Institute of Performing Arts, which uh, just recently again had a graduation. He's done poetry. He's been a book author with High in the Clouds and Urban Furry t- Tale. Um, mm. He's done animated films, Rupert the Frogs and the Frog Song, which is one of my all-time. I love that film because of the mm-hmm. music. The music is wonderful. Um, Tro- Tropic Island Hum mm. um, is another one. Um, he did uh, Damier's Law about Honoré Damier. Um, that's another one. Mm-hmm. He's produced documentaries. He did the. He produced the produced and, and hosted the Real Buddy Holly story. He has been an activist, and and uh, this, I mean, uh, I think people are, are, I say that word, and everybody kind of first thinks of vegetarianism, but he also has been a longtime supporter of people for the ethical treatment of animals. He has been involved with the Humane Society, with the World Animal Protection, and David Shepard Wildlife Foundation. He's been a big advocate of animal rights. With Heather Mills, he they was he was a big uh, adopt a mine. He was into adopt a minefield. He has also joined the uh, Arts Against Fracking with, that Sean Lennon and Yoko Ono are very much a part of. He was instrumental in starting the the concert for New York City uh, in right. 2001, and he and he headlined that. He also was part. Of, he was not the. I don't think he, he was the founder of it, but he was. He was part of the concert for Sandy Relief, and we can't forget he has been knighted, just named a companion, which we should have mentioned in the news. But um, he was just his knighthood was just upgraded. He was named a fellow at the Royal College of Music. He was given uh, a, a, he was a recipient of the Kennedy Center Honors. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He and uh, the uh, President Barack Obama gave him the Gertrude Prize, which is the highest prize a musician can receive in America in 2010. And that's just running through the list quickly. I mean, good, you know. I mean, there, there's a man that has been honored and and has you know stepped out and done all sorts of stuff and. I mean the the you know the amazing thing is that uh, you know he continues to do it. So yeah, bingo. it's a good thing you have that list because if I just had to come up with things off the top of my head, I'd come up with some of it. But there's so much that the man's done that you can easily overlook. Mm-hmm. And I just remembered one thing you didn't say, and only one thing. Well, <laughs> there's that? probably more that he supported Friends of the Earth. Okay. You know, during the 1989-90 tour, and he's been you know a, a big advocate. Uh, you know, for for saving the environment through the years. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. I also also forgot Super Furry Animals, uh, Liverpool Sound Collage, which was actually done with Peter Blake. Uh, that was on my list here. Um, mm. uh, for people who are interested in his uh, his uh, stuff away from the Beatles, there's a great ebook. It's again, it's an ebook. I'm not sure if it's a paperback. I know I have it in. Ebook form uh, that I got it from Amazon. It's only like four four ninety nine or something. It's called The Unknown Paul McCartney by Ian Peel, and he goes through all of that stuff. And there's a discography at the end, and it's an excellent it's an excellent book. It's uh, very well detailed. Mm. So, okay, there, there you go. Your turn. Good. Your turn, sir. <laughs> well, when I think of Paul McCartney, there's a lot of things I think about, but. Most of all, I think about his diversity and how eclectic he is musically. And for some people, that may not be a big deal. You know, not everybody has varied tastes. 
but I do. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that I grew up on the Beatles and Top 40 radio, and I was exposed to a lot of different musical styles through them. So I credit the Beatles so much in, in just educating me to so many different styles of music. And I have to thank Paul most of all for that. Um, I just wrote down a whole bunch of different styles of music that he has been working with through his career, Beatles and solo. Obviously, you have to say the ballads and the love songs. He's been, you know, some people think of him as being the greatest, the greatest writer when it comes to love songs. Mm -hmm. And who can argue with that? You know, I can always make the case. We can always do a show. Paul versus John and George as far as songwriters and all. But Paul has written some of the greatest love songs ever of all time. And then there's all the rockers, too. You can go from I Saw Her Standing There to I'm Down to Jet to Junior's Farm. You know, there's so many of them. And he's been so skillful at coming up with some of the best rockers, Helter Skelter being one of the heaviest in the Beatles catalog. There's uh, dancehall music or vaudeville music. He's very well known for doing songs like When I'm 64 and Honey Pie. Mm-hmm. And that's, later that's- on. That's one of my. Fa- I, I, that's one thing I've always loved about him, is mm. doing those songs. Uh, I've always had a, a real fondness for that stuff, and uh, I've always loved the fact that he's done that. But you know, he just shows that he's been interested in all different styles of music. Because when you talk about all this pre-rock and roll stuff, yeah, you can talk about kisses on the bottom and standards and all that, and writing songs in that vein, like my Valentine. But he's also written not just the dance hall uh, songs, but there's something like, for example, an instrumental like Thingamy Bob. Now, Thingamy Bob, which was a single by the Black Dyck Mills Brass Band in mm-hmm. 1968, which was used for a TV theme at the time, is very much like something that I would categorize as being in a Hal Roach movie or Hal Roach film, like The Little Rascals or something, or Laurel and Hardy. And it fits that style. It doesn't sound like when I'm 64, but it's something different. It's mainly brass instruments. Yeah, there would be on that. Mm -hmm. But that's something completely different from when I'm 64 and you gave me the answer and those type songs. And then there's an instrumental, which I really love, called uh, Goodnight Lonely Princess, which is on... Uh, Give My Regards to Broad Street. It's a bonus track that's on the CD. And it's this instrumental, which sounds like it came from the 30s or 40s, that Lawrence Welk conducted. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, it's got that kind of a feel to it. And I love that. These are the kind of things that he slips into his catalog. He wouldn't do like a whole album of that, except for Kisses on the Bottom. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you either know this or you don't. Mm -hmm. This just shows, you know how varied he is in all these different styles of music. He's embraced show tunes, not only with the stuff from Kisses on the Bottom, but going back to Till There Was You and Mm -hmm. A Taste of Honey and and singing Over the Rainbow live uh, in concert. Um, Till Till There Was You was really a, a risky proposition back in 1964 because he was a rock man doing... You know, a, a Broadway tune, and that was, and he pulled it off magnificently. Mm. And they really, and they really did a great version of that song. And I love the fact, was it, um, which tour was it that he pulled that out again? Which tour did he do that song? Oh, he he did that in the mid two thousands. Right. It's yeah. It's on the uh, the space within us. I think he did. Right. It. Right, and that can, and that version was great. It was wonderful, mm-hmm. but, and it you know, and, and it really showed that he he could still not only could he still do it, but he did a great job with it back back then. And right. So, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that that uh, our, a band, uh, a rock and roll group, would do something like "Till There Was You," I mean, it was obviously done to appeal to the parents in '64, but it, it worked in more ways than one, I think. So. Well, I think early on, the Beatles tried so many different styles to appeal to a broad audience. Mm -hmm. And I think Brian Epstein wanted them to continue that way. Right. Which is why when the Deck Audition recordings happened, he wanted them to showcase all these different styles of music and include a few originals in there. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Um, Also, you got to bring up all the classical music that Paul's done. You go back to the Beatle days, and you've got songs like, obviously, Yesterday and Eleanor Rigby. 
and she's leaving home that have classical arrangements to them. But then you have to go even further and go into all of his classical music in his solo career, like the Liverpool Oratorio and Standing Stone, which is very different in style to me from the Oratorio. Mm -hmm. And then there's also different classical pieces that he's done for specific instruments. Right. Uh, there was actually, and he's never released this, but I think that concert that he did with Elvis Costello, where he performed a few songs with Elvis, where I think it was to honor the Queen, I'm not sure, I don't remember all the details, but there was a performance of one of his classical works at the time called Stately Horn, which was all horn instruments. Is it, isn't, that on, that. Um, isn't that on working classical? No. It that isn't? was not included on there. No. Oh. I think I accidentally taped it when it was performed at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> oh, okay, Mr. Cozen. Mm. Don't know how What's it happened. The title, the title again, I'm looking uh, at the Stately Horn. Yeah. No, it is not on Working Classical. Mm. So there you go. Mm. And there's even, um, in recent years, he's composed classical music for guitar only, which hasn't come out officially and he wrote a guitar so, concerto too yeah so i mean he's always dabbling in everything you can't just say it's classical music because you know there's different types of classical music to write for specific instruments mm -hmm. so he's even done that then you get into the experimental side of paul you can go back to like steve was saying carnival of light and i actually look at certain tracks throughout his solo career as being experimental in its own way improvisational like Karina Crory from the first McCartney album, which I find a fascinating track. I personally do. I don't know how you guys feel about it. But um, something like that, which you probably wouldn't expect to hear from Paul. But, you know, like we've said, he's dabbled in everything. Mm -hmm. um, a track like Loop, First Indian on the Moon, I think is very experimental for that time. Doing all the stuff on uh, Press to Play, the electronic stuff. Moving on to The Fireman which uh, the first couple of albums was uh, all ambient music and uh, not exactly what I would call, I don't know how many people actually like ambient music because it doesn't, it's not commercial. It's not melodies that stick in your head, mm -hmm. but serves a purpose and you could consider it background music. There may be a lot of people listening who enjoy that. And then you move on to Electric Arguments, which to me was pretty much a continuation of some of the stuff that Paul had already done on Press to Play, and even on, uh, say, um, uh, Driving Rain, mm -hmm. with uh, giving up talking. So you, you've got all these electronic sounds that Paul was doing, as far as experimentation is concerned. Uh, you were talking, Steve, about the songs he did for animated films. Another side to him altogether. We mm -hmm. all stand together. Some people make fun of him for that song. I thought it was brilliant. <laughs> oh, I did. I, I love that song. I, th I think that's a darling. Well, I like that whole that whole uh, animated film. I think it's a darling film. Yeah. So. Well, not not just that, but Tropic Island Hum, like you mentioned. You know, he has this gift for. It's very Disney esque. The stuff that he was writing for these films, and it fits the film. You know, it suits a purpose, and it works perfectly for what he's striving to do here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wish he'd do more of that. And we've, we've been hearing about this full-length animated film, High in the Clouds, which you were just talking about, Steve. So uh, there's supposed to be a full soundtrack for that, which I'm curious to hear. Mm -hmm. There's folk music. You can go back to the Beatles, you know, I'm Looking Through You, Blackbird, you know, those songs, Mother Nature's Son. The first McCartney album's got that kind of style to it. A lot of the acoustic stuff that he's done, you know, it's kind of folkish in a way. Calico Skies, those kind of songs. Um, country music. How about a song like Sally G? Mm -hmm. Sally G, to me, is, is a perfect country pop song. I wish he'd do more of that stuff. Country Dreamer is kind of in that vein. Dance tracks. I know that's not a favorite of Alan's in mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, the dance version of No More Lonely Nights, doing songs like Good Night Tonight. Uh, good sign, you know, he's experimented with songs like that, Pretty Little Head, you know, 12-inch versions, more dance versions of his songs. Mm -hmm. He's got into songs that I wouldn't necessarily categorize as jazz, but they kind of have, have jazz overtones that could lend themselves to jazz arrangements, like Distractions, 
right. can easily think of as being somewhat jazzy. Um, even going back to um, Bluebird, you know, I love the the Howie Casey sax solo in there. It's got a jazz feel to it. Um, a song like Right Away from the Press to Play Sessions has a jazz feel to it. So he's dabbled in all these different styles of music, and I'm sure I've forgotten one or two. <laughs> actually, actually, I was going to mention two the, two things you forgot, or three things actually. Um, getting back to the the classical thing, Garland for Linda, uh-huh. Etchy e- Cormeum, and Ocean's Kingdom, the ballet. There you right. go. <laughs> and and a mm-hmm. leaf, and a leaf. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which was classical music for just piano. Mm-hmm. So he's done all these different things. And it's amazing that he's been able to do it all. And as far as I'm concerned, he's done it all very well. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I think, I don't think this is the show to, to, to be critical of that, but cause I can, I can, I can be critical of one or two things, but uh, um, I mean, you have to give him, you know, a, a credit for trying this stuff and, and being, a, I mean, he's been able to pull it off. I mean, Getting the idea to do it is one thing. Actually, pulling it off, for example, with like with Ocean's Kingdom, is another. Mm. And so, you know, he's been, you know, he's done all that. And he, there, there's almost it's seemingly it's seemingly like there's almost nothing he can't do. But uh, there's right. very little that he hasn't done. So right, even it, uh, uh, as I recall, there's a YouTube video where he um, he made pancakes or something like that. Didn't he do that too? <laughs> Oh, he did something cooking. He, yeah, man, I think it was mashed potatoes or something. Was it mashed yeah. potatoes? There we go. So, what next? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, he's never done like a Broadway show, although he's recorded Broadway songs, a few of them. So, I'd love to see him try and tackle that. He probably won't, but, you know, and there are some things he hasn't done. You know? There's yeah, the, the book of poetry and the readings that he gave from it. Mm-hmm. That's Blackbird, yeah. Right, yeah. right. There's just so much here. I mean, it's just, uh, it's it's really, um, you know, it's mind-boggling. Uh, the Allen Ginsberg collaboration is is uh, pretty astounding when you think about it. Um, and I still think the Kisses on the, the whole way Kisses on the Bottom worked was pretty astounding, too. But, uh, I mean, it's cra- it's crazy. You know, it's crazy all the stuff that he's done. So. It's amazing to think that in one lifetime that, that anyone could do <laughs> all that Paul McCartney's done. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's not even counting all the touring that he's done and all the incredible shows that he's put on. Right. So, uh, <laughs> and he's got another album supposedly in the works, according well, to... Well, you know, uh, until the day he goes, he'll be working, I'm sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, he's al- he always keeps busy with something. You kind of reminded me of... Um, the book Blackbird there, Alan, and also uh, Paul's paintings. You don't hear him talk about that now. I wonder if he keeps at that. Mm. So, Well, some of those things, you know, you th- uh, you figure they were probably vanity projects, and some things worked out better than others. But, uh, I mean, still, I mean, the fact that he, the painting, the, the painting it was kind of, was not what you'd call middle-of-the-road painting. So... I, I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I mean, who, who knows what he does in his, the privacy of his home? I well, mean, I'm not an expert on paintings and artists in that in that regard, but it's nice to know that there's a book out there where you can actually look at it and judge for yourself. Right. Just mm-hmm. to know that he that he did try doing that. The same thing with having a book of poetry, where it's it goes beyond some of the songs that he's written. There are some some uh, poems in there that are strictly poems and nothing else. So. It's just nice to have that as well. Mm-hmm. Or, or songs that he envisions as being poetic in, in its lyrics. So, there you go. Mm-hmm. There we go. Anything else you want to add, guys? No, I, th- I think we, I think we, I think I covered all that I wanted to cover. I, I mentioned the uh, the two e-books. Oh, well, actually, I'll, I'll mention it briefly. I had the opportunity, and we, we were talking about this before, before we got started, of finally hearing the Star Wars uh, Sgt. Pepper parody, and it's absolutely wonderful. I was really, really impressed. Yeah, me and, too. Uh, it's funny. So it, it's clever. <laughs> right. 
let me get the let me I I had their name on my screen. It's uh, the they're called Pallet Swap Ninja is the group and I believe the stuff is on YouTube if you want to hear it, but it's it's really funny. It's really funny. Hmm. So I I haven't heard it yet, so I will definitely listen to it uh, in time for our next show. Okay. All right. Maybe you could even play it on your on your show. That's a possibility. There we go. There we go. <laughs> anyway, okay. I'm 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 through gabbing away. <laughs> All right. So if anyone would like to get in touch with us, let's give uh, everyone our contact information. We'll start with you, Alan. Um, probably the easiest way to get to me is through Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and uh, and through the group email. Okay. And Steve, how about you? Let's let's give let's give the folks our group email first. Group email is things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. You can also catch the show on Facebook. Uh, things we said today radio Beatles radio fans, and the show is available for download on Podbean and on YouTube, um, and it's also on the TuneIn app, and you can. Get a hold of me at BeatlesExaminer at gmail.com. I am uh, also on Facebook under my own name. I have a Beatles group called Beatles News and Information that is growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, so anybody that wants to talk about Beatle issues, uh, feel free to join in. And there we go. Yeah. And by the way, I just want to thank everyone who's written to us whether it be through Podbean or YouTube or the email address, we're getting more and more emails. And it's great to hear your responses to our shows. And, and uh, I think maybe if we could, maybe we'll make it a regular feature to respond to some of your, your letters or, or your comments about the show. You know, we're getting more and more of them. I can't believe our audience has grown so much on YouTube in particular. Have mm-hmm. you noticed that? Yes, I have. I, very, I have quite a bit. Mm. So thanks to all of you who have written to us. Um, as for me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. And I just want to mention, because um, so many people wrote in with my last contest, I couldn't get over it. <laughs> I had a special contest on my website where I was giving away three vinyl albums, and they're all double albums. Sgt. Pepper with the bonus disc of outtakes, every song from Sgt. Pepper in the same sequence, the Flowers and the Dirt double album with the bonus disc of Paul and Elvis acoustic demos and George Harrison's Live in Japan. I'm doing one that's almost exactly the same right now. I'm giving away Sgt. Pepper, Flowers in the Dirt, and George Harrison's Dark Horse album, all on vinyl. It's all 180-gram vinyl, and it's all from Universal Music Enterprises. So if you want to find out how to win, you go to my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. And also, uh, I do have Bruce Beiser's new book, to give away on Sgt. Pepper, The Beatles and Sgt. Pepper, A Fan's Perspective, which is now part of my one of nine prizes on my Beatles trivia and games page, which you can play every single week on my website. Again, that's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. So this has been great and our special birthday tribute to Paul McCartney. And for Steve Marinucci and Alan Cozen, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening. And we will see you next time.